Hi, uh, welcome to this webinar on international relations in the post-COVID world, uh, strategic competition and the future of the liberal order. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Won Hyuk Lim. I'm a professor at KDI School uh, in Korea. I'm also uh, visiting uh, Johns Hopkins sites for this year and next as a visiting professor. Well, uh, the origin of this webinar goes back to a meeting I had with uh, Professor Ken Calder at Johns Hopkins Sykes. Uh, KDI School was organizing a, a new project, research project on international relations in the post-COVID world. And I wanted to uh, uh, get his advice on uh, the kind of people I could recruit uh, for this project. And uh, he graciously uh, recommended a number of uh, 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 world-class uh, scholars uh, who could contribute to uh, this project. Uh, this project represents the latest uh, in collaborative effort uh, between KDI School and uh, Johns Hopkins SAIS. And I'm glad that KDI School is co-organizing this event with uh, SAIS Reichauer Center. Uh, uh, and without further ado, I'd like to now introduce uh, Professor uh, Ken Calder to give some opening remarks. Dr. Lim, it's a real pleasure for the Rice Center for East Asian Studies to be collaborating with you, of course, and also with the KDI School on this uh, timely program. I'm especially pleased that we've been able to enlist uh, such a distinguished group to participate including several of my size colleagues. Um, Professor David Lampton, he's now a senior research fellow at SAIS, but for many years our vice dean of faculty affairs and also director of China studies. Dr. Carla Freeman, also a distinguished China specialist at SAIS and director of our Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, Professor Matthias Matisse, one of our key international political economy specialists and also a, uh, a well-known specialist on the uh, European integration. Dr. Yokoko Pepe, uh, now he's with the German Institute of Security and Political Affairs, but, and, uh, but he is continuing his association with uh, the Reichauer Center at SAIS, and he's served as an adjunct uh, visiting faculty member here. We also have two uh, distinguished uh, specialists uh, from uh, elsewhere. Uh, and first, I'm in, uh, pleased to introduce Professor Alan Alexandrov of the University of Toronto, and who's currently also the director of their uh, Global Cemetery Project. And finally, uh, our moderator uh, for today's program, uh, Professor uh, Stafford Haggard, Stephen Haggard, a longtime uh, friend and a former colleague to many of us, who is currently uh, the Krauss Distinguished Professor in the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, uh, San Diego. Steph, it's a, a real pleasure to have you uh, with us for this timely program. Thanks very much, Kent. Um, uh, I, I very much look forward to, um, to moderating this program. Excuse me while I'm just making sure my, my video has started. Uh, my role as moderator is, is partly timekeeper. Uh, we have some really terrific presentations today, and so let me talk a little bit about the format. Uh, what we're going to do is talk first about China, which is obviously a key player in this whole question of what a post-COVID world will look like. And we'll have a presentations from David Lamb and, and Kent Calder. And then we'll be joined by Carla Freeman, who will lead a, dis a discussion. We'll then turn uh, to Wan Hyuk Lim, who will talk about the general origins of the project. And we'll turn in the last part of the program to developments in three parts of the world that will be uh, particularly significant to watch. Uh, Matthias Matthijs will talk to us about Europe, which is clearly undergoing a rethink about uh, developments in Asia and the China problem. Uh, Jacoco Pepe, who will talk about Eurasia, and Alan Alexandrov, who will talk about issues of effective multilateralism and the role that multilateral institutions will play in this process. I think we're just going to dive right in. David, do you want to get us going? <laughs> 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Haggard, and, and thank you for the organizers. And um, uh, I'll try to be brief and telegraphic, and uh, then we can clarify what needs to be clarified in the course of events. I think the core theme of my uh, paper and this talk really is that the United States and China are in a negative feedback loop. Uh, and uh, each move that each side is making is um, exaggerating and accelerating counter moves by the other. And it's not just a military uh, dynamic, but it's also the military and security aspects are spilling over into every other aspect of the relationship. It's contaminated the security competition, is contaminating the economic dynamic, and you see uh, export controls being slapped on, obviously tariffs, retaliation on each other's industries, particularly evident in the cyber area with WeChat and TikTok. So one of my basic premises is, is the security relationship is worse now than I think many people recognize. The PLA is using uh, the United States as its planning and uh, wargaming uh, opponent and quite frankly, the United States is as well. And this security dynamic then is infecting cultural relations, you see it with students uh, in United States universities, uh, issues of espionage, intellectual property. Uh, another major theme is that this isn't just, however, about military, it's really about domination, geoeconomic domination of the 21st century. Uh, and so China, for instance, with its BRI is building out a, uh, a network of connectivity. It includes railroads, cyber, highways, ports, and so on to change the economic geography of its periphery and make China the hub. Uh, and the United States has to decide how it's going to compete in this environment. Uh, and therefore, educational exchanges, for instance, become very, and research and we, research collaboration become very competitive, uh, and therefore we become very concerned about uh, what the Chinese role in American universities, think tanks, and so forth. If I were to put it a little differently, I'd say there are sort of three big trends that are going on that are uh, negative. One is the U.S.-China relationship has moved from what I would call reassurance to deterrence. And as I argue in the paper, this, this story goes back to 2010, 2011, when the Obama administration began what it called the Asian rebalance. But the point, reassurance, was trying to uh, develop agreements uh, with China that would reassure uh, that we didn't need to go down the arms race path. Uh, deterrence, on the other hand, is built on threat. And what you now see is the United States and China in increasingly explicit terms threatening one another. And you're seeing this in particular in the Taiwan Straits now, where the U.S. is changing uh, in a very real way the content of the one China policy. Second thing you see is a macro trend is going from sort of what you might call free market, aspiring to free trade competition in the economic and trade realm, to now you find increasingly both sides, including the United States, moving towards more uh, managed economic relations, uh, more planned uh, industrial intervention, industrial policy, and so forth. Uh, and uh, finally, the big third big macro trend is really increasing what I would call ideological conflict. And I'll just wind up my preliminary con uh, comments by saying you can do nothing better to understand this, uh, this growing ideological conflict than read Secretary of State Pompeo's July 23rd um, speech at the Nixon Library, the, in a sense, the birthplace of the One China policy. And what he's basically saying, and what I think the Chinese believe is the purpose now of a U.S. foreign policy with respect to China, is to, um, uh, to um, in effect, bring about change, what uh, the Chinese would call regime change, and focus on the Chinese uh, Communist Party. Last sentence is that COVID did not create all this. 
but in the COVID world, now it exaggerates every one of these conflicts. Uh, David, thanks very much. It's a very interesting uh, and great lead off for us. Let me just pose a few questions to you. Uh, and I guess they center on the responsibilities of the two major powers for breaking this downward cycle. If, if, if the metaphor you've employed is correct, then we would imagine relations to continue to worsen. Um, one, one obligation that I think many Americans think that the Chinese have is to clarify some of their intentions, uh, particularly with respect to things like their development of their, their military capabilities. But my question to you would be, what, what responsibility does the United States have in this regard? Uh, as you know, there's a very big debate about whether engagement is dead or was mistaken. Uh, do you hold to that view, or do you think there's scope uh, for the U.S. to figure out uh, a more positive engagement strategy, either under a second Trump administration or under a Biden administration? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I think one of the responsibilities of the United States is to recognize that um, not only engagement, but much of development policy of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s succeeded in producing more powerful countries, whether it's China on the one or it contributed to it, or whether it's China or Brazil or, uh, a, a, or Europe that came out of World War II. And so we have more powerful countries. So the first responsibility of the United States, it seems to me, is to adjust its expectations that in the future, it's probably not going to be as dominant in all respects as it was in the past. So I think that isn't to say we're in decline. It doesn't say that there shouldn't be international norms. But the United States is going to have to be more accommodating to a lot of people. And so I think the first, you know, if you sort of think of America first as the expression of the opposite of what I'm suggesting, I'm suggesting our responsibility is to cooperate and multilaterally and not withdraw from, you know, Paris Accord, not withdraw necessarily from the Iran Agreement, uh, not withdraw from WTO. So I think we have to adjust our expectations. That doesn't mean dumb down or be satisfied with a insignificant role. But on the other hand, it was precisely the, the policies of the 60s that I think contributed to an environment where lots of others are becoming powerful. That's, that's, that's extremely interesting. Um, uh, let me let me tap your, your, your deep knowledge of, of, uh, of Chinese foreign policy to pose a question about the COVID era. You know, following the global financial crisis, I think there was a perception that some in the Chinese strategic community were seeing this as an opportunity to press advantage as the United States appeared to be weakened. Um, that, I think that was a strategic mistake. And there is this question of whether China's overreach do you see a similar dynamic at play now in the COVID period where China may be uh, taking advantage of, of this pandemic in order to press advantage? It certainly seems that if you look at the litany of issues from Hong Kong to the Taiwan Straits to India to the South China Sea, that this would be the case. What's your read on that? Well, uh, first of all, I think in all things China, we have to start with the sentence that there are different views in China and there's often a struggle over balance within policy in China. I think on this Absolutely. issue, there are, are sort of two lines of thought in China. One is, uh, you know, and it's often expressed, to, are the Chinese favor Biden or Trump? The people that would favor Trump would have a logic that um, um, look at, from China's viewpoint, they couldn't have a, a leader in the United States that would more debilitate the United States than Trump. And there is a substantial sense of, uh, in I think, in opinion in China that Trump is not nearly as bad for China as you might think initially. The others say, no, China's, uh, you know, uh, entered all of the major regimes in the international life. Uh, it needs a stable uh, market and relationship with the U.S. And there's a, what you might call the almost the pro-engagement school in China. So I don't think there's uniform. Um, uh, but yes, I think if you look at the military, for example, 
they see a distracted, overstretched United States, whether it be prior military commitments, they see that we have not managed well our COVID and that there's no end in sight right at the moment uh, for the United States. And now there's the time that China can push more muscularly uh, to secure in its sense, its periphery. And you see all around China now, attempts to, in the Chinese way of thinking, consolidate the periphery. And that's what they think they're doing in, in Xinjiang, is what they think they're doing in Taiwan Straits with increased military activity. It's what they're doing in the Himalayas. So I would say in terms of foreign policy now, the more assertive uh, strain is uh, in, in the driver's seat. And that uh, Xi Jinping has staked his legitimacy really on the notion that we don't have to hide our light of international power under a bushel anymore, China's back. And that's his legitimation. So point is, there are different views, but I think the more assertive views now are reflected in Xi Jinping's thinking and action and that of the security apparatus in China. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I think, I, I guess I think two things at the same time. I think the, the failure to recognize the diversity in Chinese strategic thinking is itself potentially a strategic mistake because right. there are obviously opportunities created by that. But at the same time, the Chinese political system is clearly moving in a direction of greater concentration of decision-making authority. And there is a very clear vision there. Right. Uh, David, let me bring in Kent Calder. Um, Kent, as you know, has worked for a long time on Northeast Asia more generally. He has expertise not only in Japan, but on, on the Korean Peninsula and China as well. Kent, do you want to um, follow David? And then we'll bring Carla in. Yes, thank you very much, um, Staff. We have, I think, a very, very interesting discussion. Let me perhaps uh, broaden it just slightly from uh, US-China to the broader trans-Pacific relationship, because I think both uh, many of the problems uh, that are emerging for the United States and for the world are, uh, they have a core of US-China interaction, but, uh, the, but both the problem and the resolution also uh, relates to the broader region, as well as, of course, to the United States. The one main thing that I would add to the assessment that uh, Mike has just given us is that um, there is a, a historic shift to my mind in the dynamics of uh, trans-Pacific relations flowing from the ways that the United States and East Asia are responding uh, to this pandemic, uh, which is to suggest, uh, to agree with Mike, Yes, uh, it intensifies, but the intensification actually of the changes may be greater uh, than we have been uh, suggesting. Um, the United States, of course, now has well over 200,000 fatalities as a result of COVID. It has more than 7 million uh, people infected, over 20% of the total for the world. Um, these estimates recently we have heard University of Washington suggesting by the beginning of next year, we that could even see that double, of course, depending on the response uh, in the coming weeks. With the Spanish flu, of course, the second wave was far worse than the first, and we've seen a second wave building in Europe. Now, uh, the economic effects, of course, have been remarked. The stock market's been soaring, uh, but uh, and digitalization is proceeding, but of course, unemployment also has risen sharply. The U.S. had uh, the largest spike of the G7 in unemployment, um, and the GDP also, of course, fell sharply. The key point, I think, apropos of trans-Pacific relations is this is a sharp contrast to what was happening in East Asia, not only in China. Of course, China first in with, uh, uh, how first out or not, of course, may be unclear, but certainly back to a positive growth, growth track. The United States, you know, is still well in negative territory. India, many of the suggestions could be for 2020 even, 
20% negative uh, growth, a tremendous fall in India and, and in some other places, but not in China, not in Taiwan, Korea, certainly uh, Japan has not done badly. So East Asia is coming out of this you know, with an intensified version of what, you know, what we once saw. I know, Steph, you and I were, have been looking at this for some years. We were talking in the early 80s about the acceleration of East Asian growth and paths from the periphery and what this means. And I think we're seeing this pattern being intensified. Now, to strengthen that, I think we, a word should be said about the United States. I've mentioned the scale of what we've seen. I'm unfortunately a little bit pessimistic about the shorter run for us, partly uh, because of uh, the, you know sort of the, the way policy has been managed, especially at the national level, uh, the decentralization in many ways of the U.S. healthcare system, and the politicization of that system, uh, which are intensifying this problem of asymmetry in the responses of uh, the United States in Asia. I think this leads probably to uh, more thinking about industrial policy, probably more political turbulence, um, accelerated polarization. The uh, elections, of course, will have much to do uh, with how that per pattern proceeds domestically. But let me proceed uh, briefly to my conclusions about Trans-Pacific relations. First of all, um, the heart of this geopolitically, of course, is that China is coming out of this as the second largest economy in the world and in PPP, arguably even the largest, with a head of steam, which is significantly greater than what we have. And the longer the uh, uh, inability to deal with this continues in the US, the worse that problem becomes. That naturally means accelerated tensions, as uh, Professor Lambton has pointed out. I do think that there are multilateral possibilities, particularly if we see a new administration. Uh, his, Mike has already alluded to those. Uh, but in the bottom line, taking advantage of the strengths of other parts of Asia, thinking about uh, this emerging situation, not simply from the perspective of US-China, but broadening that to think about the relative strengths of Korea, of Japan in particular, uh, to looking carefully at the situation across the straits and what this means, the potential role of Taiwan going forward, um, Singapore as well. Um, so those issues. Um, uh, offshoring or reshoring, of course, is a big issue for us. My uh, analysis of the U.S. suggests certainly that will be important. But to what extent are we capable of, of reshoring uh, in a decisive way? What possibilities do we have to cooperate with our allies? Um, uh, what potential does nearshoring have? or reinforcing alliance relations through uh, deepening uh, relationships uh, with countries that we've had uh, historically strong relations. Of course, uh, uh, the United States uh, together with Korea, Japan and Korea, alliance relationships, the Quad, also involving uh, Australia and India. There are a number, I think, of important uh, geopolitical issues that no doubt will be uh, intensified. Regional issues, of course, US-China, but certainly broader questions as well. Again, th thanks. Uh, let, me, let me pick up on, on two themes and just introduce them lightly, and then we'll bring, we'll bring Carl into the discussion. And one point you make is about the economic center of gravity. And we know from simple trade models that proximity matters for trade, you know, gravity models of trade. And that, and that as China recovers very much more rapidly than Europe, Japan, the United States, and even other parts of Asia, it suggests the possibility that countries along China's rim are going to become more dependent on China, uh, not less. 
And so as the United States seeks to expand its offshore balancing concept to the Indo-Pacific, which I personally think is a strategy that both Democrats and Republicans can support, it's facing countries along China's rim that are potentially more dependent than they were in the past and thus more vulnerable to leverage. Do you want to comment on that? I mean, of course, this takes us into how each individual country is going to respond to this challenge, but is there something general to be said here? Yes, I think definitely. Uh, the most important point for us, I think, is the importance of a proactive approach. I felt this with respect to the chorus um, agreement, the trade agreement with Korea uh, some years ago. Uh, it certainly would prevail, uh, apply to uh, U.S.-Japan relations as well. The natural forces, economic forces alone, are going to create this possibility of deepened interdependence uh, with China. Of course, there also is considerable uh, uh, disquiet about that, I think, from some of the uh, nations around the rim of China. Um, so, uh, so there's something to build on if the United States is proactive. This again also raises the importance of multilateralism, institutions such as the Asian Development Bank, uh, you know, which pl has played a important role across history since the 80s in um, Asian development. Uh, broader uh, regional configurations that are not simply uh, China-centric, but that include a broader ties in areas like technology, you know, areas like food supply, energy supply, the uh, scale of China's population actually is its disadvantage. Conversely, the technical and uh, the abundance which the United States has in those three areas, technology, energy, and food, seem to be an argument for trans-Pacific interdependence uh, if the United States is sufficiently uh, proactive to capitalize on that. Well, again, you know, I, I couldn't agree more, but, but so we have a little controversy. Let me just uh, point out a dilemma in U.S. policy. Um, if, if, if we do get a Biden presidency, it's likely that some of this will occur naturally, so to speak. The United States will gravitate back towards policies which are more open to multilateralism, more supportive of the alliances. But then the question becomes, what is the content of an Indo-Pacific strategy? Uh, for example, would a Biden administration be comfortable with going back to an instrument like the TPP? And I'll answer my own question, you know, eh, not clear. And, and so I think one of the challenges the United States faces is not only being more assertive and focused, but figuring out what is it that we're going to be assertive and focused around? You know, what are the issues? Can we, can we yeah. make economic integration a theme that would uh, flush out, flesh out <laughs> the Indo-Pacific strategy? Or yeah. does a, a democratic administration face significant challenges in that regard? Let me, uh, let me just add uh, two points that I think are important in that regard. First of all, um, a bit more asymmetry or a, mo a bit more symmetry in the uh, US-Asia uh, dialogue. The idea of the idea of a global a, a, a policy a policy dialogues of various kinds between the U.S. and Asia. I think that the possibility of learning from Asia on some important areas, um, digitalization, of course, is proceeding. The uh, Koreans and Japan have been uh, very active. Japan just appointed its first digital minister, for example. Um, digitalization as a way of dealing with uh, many of the problems in the relationship. Uh, we have, of course, Silicon Valley, but th they have uh, a dynamic approaches to this. That's one dimension. The other, I think the core of uh, this deepened uh, trans-Pacific interaction, as I see it really, is more Northeast Asia in the short run than it is sort of the so-called Indo-Pacific. Um, India has, uh, is undergoing a tremendous uh, setbacks as a result of COVID. Uh, 
I think it's going to take longer for India uh, to come out of this and to play a dynamic role in most areas. Uh, so partly because of the effect of COVID, it's really uh, Korea and Japan uh, and the Northeast Asian uh, quadrant, I think. Oh, good. Well, that, that, that'll provide a basis for, for a little bit of dissent among the panel. I, I'm more favorably disposed to uh, uh, upping our attention on, on Southeast Asia as a piece of this strategy. I wouldn't disagree. But Carla, can I ask you to join? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to do everything at once, but, but certainly I interpret the BRI as focused less on what's happening on the, on the Eurasian landmass, which is just to me a pile of risk for China than it is in Southeast Asia where the money is. And I think that's going to be the area where there's going to be significant um, competition. Uh, Carla, if you can um, open your video and, and why don't you lead us and we'll have a kind of four-way discussion with you in the lead. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, well, first let me thank you so much, uh, Dr. Haggard, and my thanks to Dr. Lim as well and the KDI School of Public Policy and Management and colleagues here at SICE at the Reichauer Center uh, for including me in this uh, very timely webinar. And it really is a great honor for me to join all of you, uh, including my very distinguished colleagues, both of whom I've learned so much from and continue to do so, and, and, and today not least. Uh, since there's so little time, and I'm happy to jump into the broader discussion if you prefer, Dr. Haggard, or I can make some uh, comments that I, uh, following my, my uh, outline that I prepared in advance. Uh, let me know. No, no, please, absolutely, yeah. feel free. Uh, but I thought that rather than comment specifically on each of the author's papers in succession, I'd try to highlight uh, what I saw as some cross-cutting concerns about the post-COVID world that, world that emerged from the two of them. Uh, and I'll try to emphasize some of the points uh, that did, they didn't get to articulate in their, in their brief presentations and that haven't yet come up in the Q&A. Um, I, I won't mention it, but I do think Professor Calder's points about the uneven impacts on the Asia-Pacific, the Indo-Pacific of the pandemic are really worth thinking uh, about further for their implications for regional security and development. Um, and I should say before I lay out my, uh, my points uh, that both of the author's papers deliver, as always, uh, val really valuable research. Um, and uh, are worth reading carefully. I, I really think Professor Lampton's point that the US-China relationships uh, historical three pillars or what he actually calls the tripod legs uh, have not only been weakened simultaneously, but that all three legs of the relationship, security, economic, and societal, diplomatic, those have been all been securitized at the same time so that you have a relationship that as a whole has been securitized. And the fact that this is taking place in the middle of a pandemic, which is already imposing high economic costs as well as significant costs in terms of America's uh, global standing, uh, particularly at this point, um, where the potential spread of infectious diseases um, uh, has been, had in the past, you know, it is spreading, but it so had been so importantly mitigated in the past by U.S.-China co uh, cooperation, and that's not happening, uh, is, is really, uh, really, really significant. Um, and it really also a point that Professor Lampton makes in his paper is that these strains between the U.S. and China since they've been worsening during the pandemic when we would have expected the pandemic to have mitigated them. This really dims the prospects uh, for a post-COVID economic recovery because cooperation between the two countries in the past has been so important uh, for, for uh, a global economic recovery. Uh, Professor Calder's paper has substantial analysis on trends in the U.S. political economy as a result of the pandemic, and, our, it, and that that first part is uh, that constitutes the first part of his paper and is really uh, really valuable to read. I haven't seen anything that kind of goes through the various uh, impacts so carefully uh, and then relates them to uh, broader international trends, um, but. Um, Professor Calder also looks at the impact on the, of, of the pandemic on the U.S.-China relationship and the way that it's heightened mistrust uh, as a result of the COVID shock. And the way, I think importantly, he also looks at the way it's made the digital economy so central to the economies, 
of the United States and its allies. And that, uh, given the focus on uh, uh, securitization of the technology dimension of the US-China relationship, that's a very, very uh, significant uh, point. Um, let me say, with that, let me just tick off a few cross-cutting issues, uh, a number of which I've phrased as questions uh, for a possible reaction uh, by Professors Lampton and Calder, uh, and maybe depending upon time, maybe the, these will be picked up by the, the audience. Um, first, Professor Lampton uh, describes the securitization of the US-China relationship and uh, the observable implications of this for the global economy and its recovery. Um, Looking at this, regional, regional countries are surely responding. And I think a key question for this conference is what steps exactly are they taking now, not just among themselves within the region, but perhaps how they're, they're mitigating the impacts uh, of US-China tensions by reaching out beyond the region to other important actors like the United uh, European Union, for example. How, uh, how, 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 what are the interregional uh, dynamics that are emerging? In addition, uh, it would seem that regional countries would be interested in stabilizing the US-China relationship. So how exactly are they trying to do this? Are they just trying not to get trampled? Uh, where um, US allies and partners are concerned, as Professor Lampton points out, although uh, historically uh, strains in the US-China relationship have served to, to drive the United States to reinforce its, its ties uh, to its allies in the Asia Pacific. Of course, the Trump administration's pressure on allies to provide Washington with a greater security support, support means that Washington may no longer be the source of impetus to strengthen trans-Pacific ties with its allies and partners. How are our allies responding? What are they doing? As both papers make clear, it's already apparent that after the coronavirus, and this has already uh, come up, after the pandemic, the Chinese economy is going to be in better shape than the American economy. At least that's the way things look right now. Will that not lead traditional economic and security partners of the United States in the region to strengthen their ties to China as they try to re-enliven their own economies? And both, uh, both uh, Professor Lampton and, Cal and Calder have written extensively on geoeconomics and cur current trends as have already been mentioned, suggest a stronger tidal pull toward China and the region, potentially away from the United States. So where does that leave the United States and its interests as a Pacific power? And Professor Lampton, you mentioned some policy shifts that the United States needs to undertake, including re-embracing multilateralism. Uh, but to somewhat rephrase uh, Professor Haggard's question, is what is happening in terms of the economic pull of the Chinese economy, and you could add uh, the role of the Belt and Road, so powerful that the United States needs a totally fresh set of policies to engage the region uh, uh, deeply again with us? Uh, so perhaps to qualify exactly what uh, you mean, Professor Calder, by proactive policies, you've, you've mentioned a few, and Professor uh, uh, Lampton, you'd out outlined a number of proposals in your paper, and maybe you could mention some of those. Um, I also want to just highlight the role of firms briefly. Professor Calder had pointed to the role of regional multinational firms as conduits for economic flows between the United States and the region. And many of these also have deep stakes in relations with China. How are these firms responding to strains in the US-China relationship, particularly in the context of the declining inclination that Professor Lampton describes in, in his paper on the part of the American business community to expend the political or economic capital to support the US-China relationship. And then my last point, uh, both authors observe uh, with specific reference to the pandemic, um, to global health cooperation, that we will get through this pandemic with the global health system probably in worse, worse shape than it was before the pandemic. And we can blame you know, Beijing's lack of transparency at the beginning uh, and the truculent American response. Uh, so even as individual countries in the region have de dealt successfully with COVID-19, the fact is that the fallout on the World Health Organization, as well as other nodes of global health cooperation has been damaging. Uh, so, Given that effective national delivery of public goods like health is an important aspect of governance across the Asia Pacific, if it is not apparently seen as a public good in the United States, uh, I think this is 
uh, there's a question about how the countries around the region may be strengthening either their unilateral capabilities to address the pan pandemic, but also how they are working on new regional modes of addressing uh, uh, pa uh, transnational health and other transnational threats. Uh, one can draw parallels perhaps to the Asia financial crisis of the late 1990s or even, uh, even to the more recent uh, global financial crisis in terms of, of the region trying to respond to failures in, uh, by the United States to deliver uh, global public goods. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Lots of questions and uh, hope that you'll pick up on some of these themes and some of these questions in your responses. Well, Carla, Carla you're on you're underselling your role a little bit. I mean, those were not just questions, but were great substantive comments in their own right. Um, Mike and, and Kent, why don't I just ask each of you to maybe pick one from this menu and respond. Um, we want to turn to one hook, but I think a lot of things that Carla brought up, which, which are surprising that we haven't talked about them, like things like global health cooperation, just frontally as, as an issue that is going to obviously rise in salience. But Mike, why don't you lead us? Well, first of all, I think there was a critical uh, convergence of your um, observations, uh, Professor Haggart and, and Carla, uh, and that's about the economic pull of China and Southeast Asia and the opportunities that are there. Um, I think the first thing to say is that, um, you know, it's not clear that the Chinese, even if their economy is doing relatively well coming out of the COVID uh, fiasco, there are interest groups in China that think China's over-investing abroad and not spending sufficient money on China's old, old, old age retirement, health care, uh, uh, schools, and so forth. So China's got a contest for resources between spending abroad and at home, and it's intense, and China's uh, made some very bad investments as well as some good investments. So the current estimate is that China's committed itself to spending 120 to 150 billion a year for the next five or more years. Uh, that may or may not come to pass, and China doesn't meet all its commitments. Uh, so we got to keep in mind what are China's capabilities. Secondly, though, you ask both of you, in effect, what is the U.S. strategy or should be the U.S. strategy or position on, on uh, I'll say, countering or addressing this imbalance of economic pull? And here, I think China has a clear strategy, make itself the hub for its periphery and have human information and economic flows go to and from China. That's the simple plan. And I don't think our national strategy should be to oppose connectivity, but our strategy should be to develop what I call balanced connectivity. That is that Tokyo, Australia, the United States, Korea, would like to also see a flow that's very substantial from India through Myanmar, through uh, Thailand, through Vietnam, through Cambodia. And so we build out the network in a balanced way. So the core is how can the U.S. participate in what I think, like you said, Professor Egger, uh, the really quite dynamic growth in that region. So I think we ought to uh, up our economic gain, work with uh, foreign partners, our, our, both our allies, incentivize our country uh, companies. And I think, frankly, we've got to get back into the big project development business that World Bank and, um, uh, and our own foreign aid programs uh, moved away from for them, you know, since the uh, preceding 20 years. Yeah, no, these are, th th this is great. And of course, the, the reference to multilateralism here is quite important because one thing that the United States has traditionally done quite well is think about rules uh, and transparent rules for governing these kinds of connections. I mean, in a way, that's what American leadership has been about. It's been about legalizing and making law, making rules that are transparent and at least trying, we're sometimes hypocritical in this regard, but to, to use those rules as, as a sort of foundation for the playing field. Um, Kent, do you want to, um, uh, to take, the, take us into the next session? I, we've only got a couple minutes, but we'd like to hear from what you have to say. 
you're muted. Kent, Kent, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, okay. Um, well, I think the most crucial point, uh, you talked about global health cooperation. And uh, on that point, I think there's a very simple answer. We have to learn uh, more from East Asia. And that actually could help to, um, uh, to improve uh, relations across the Pacific. Uh, digitalization, to be concrete, is one area, certainly what Korea has done. Uh, some of its incentive, uh, on contact and tracing, uh, testing, areas like that. I think there's a lot of room uh, for that. In terms of strategy, balanced connectivity, I would agree with that, but on a sectoral basis as well, finance and uh, distribution are certainly an aspect of trans-Pacific relations. And, uh, you know, there, there are cooperative dimensions as well as conflictual across the Pacific. I'll just make one observation that I think is, is frequently forgotten, you know, that the, the amounts of money that uh, China either commits uh, or actually invests are financial markets. Um, and, and I think that those constitute a sort of asset for the Western powers. And there's a lot of thought being given to how those financial markets might be mobilized for the purpose of things like infrastructure investment uh, in ways that would be more in line with, um, with let's say, Western interests, if we can say that there is such a thing. Uh, unfortunately, there's a great discussion. Carla, thanks so much for leading that off. I want to turn now to Wanhyuk, um, because Kent, we, did you have something else, Kent? No, I was just going to say, uh, given the changes- I'm sorry, Kent, did you? I think you froze. Um, uh, am I frozen? No, you're okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Looks like we're uh, losing you, Ken. I, if, that's fine. What is if we can, I think I'll turn to one. Um, yeah. uh, we'll see if we can get you back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me just say a very brief word of introduction for those of you who are on the law, on the webinar. Um, Wan Hyuk is the entrepreneur in this project. Uh, I've known Wan Hyuk for a couple of decades. We wrote together on the Asian financial crisis and have cooperated on some other projects. Uh, but the purpose here, as I understand the project, is to really look at the intersection of the COVID crisis with this turn towards what we're calling great power competition. So Wan Hyuk, why don't you stand back and, and give us a global view, and then I want to dive into the second half of the program, where we're looking at some areas that I think have really been ignored in this discussion. Right, right. Uh, thanks for the uh, introduction. I'd like to uh, share my screen, so let me... Can you see? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what I'd like to do is to put a more global perspective on what's going on in terms of strategic competition and the future of the liberal order. And I'd like to uh, talk about pre-existing conditions before COVID, the nature of COVID shock and challenges for global cooperation. Um, uh, the, the way I'll characterize uh, the pre-existing condition before COVID shock uh, would be to say there was a breakdown of embedded uh, liberalism, uh, embedded liberalism as defined by John Ruggie, uh, the kind of liberalism embedded in social democracy on the one hand and non-discriminatory uh, multilateralism on the other hand, uh, as a result of the, the uh, harrowing, uh, harrowing uh, uh, experience with the Great Depression and World War II, as you all know. And if we take a historical and global view uh, and focus on inter-country inequality first, what we see uh, is a transition from great divergence to great convergence. Uh, what I mean by that, what do I mean by this? Um, as you know, Western Europe and its offshoots like the United States, Canada, and Australia surged ahead of the uh, rest of the world uh, around the time of the Industrial Revolution. Prior to that, uh, there had been very little, you know, uh, uh, disparity or divergence in per capita income uh, across different regions in the world. But around the time of the Industrial Revolution, uh, the West uh, surged ahead and 
dominated the world for the next two centuries. Now, the rest of the world has been catching up with the West, especially since the end of the Cold War led to the uh, acceleration of globalization. However, as we know, uh, the international order does not adequately reflect this uh, shift. And there's a danger of overcorrection as well as undercorrection. Uh, Professor Lambton talked about the need to uh, adjust expectations uh, on part of the United States. But there's also the danger of you know, emerging countries or re-emerging countries uh, trying to uh, overreach as well. So uh, this is a very delicate uh, balance we have to uh, achieve uh, in the wake of this power shift. Uh, on the domestic side, if you look at uh, intra-country intra inequality, uh, there's a transition from great compression to what is uh, commonly known as the, the uh, elephant curve or great uh, increase in inequality. As you know, after the Great Depression and World War II, many countries around the world reduced inequality and delivered broad-based economic growth to their people. This was the golden age for you know, capitalist countries from 1945 to 1973. Uh, uh, something like that. And this took place against the backdrop of a large existing income gap between the West and the rest. So, you know, labor unions, uh, social uh, security, uh, you know, welfare states and so on could be built without much problem. Uh, however, a neoliberal ascendancy with Margaret Thatcher and uh, Ronald Reagan uh, skill bias, technical change and accelerating globalization reversed this trend, as you know. And now what we see in many uh, advanced industrial countries is the emergence of nativist and anti-elitist uh, anti -elitist, uh, sentiments, as well as calls for democratic socialism, uh, which greatly complicate domestic politics. Uh, for instance, using identity politics, uh, you know, people, uh, uh, rich people who could benefit from further tax cuts and so on, actually take advantage of these uh, nativist and anti latest sentiments uh, to have their way and divert attention from greatly increasing inequality. Um, so this is not a you know, straightforward uh, domestic political development in many advanced industrial countries. So the question now is, is it possible to uh, resurrect embedded liberalism? And it really depends on two things in my view. Uh, one is to make sure that we avoid a race to the bottom by having some international agreement on tax avoidance uh, and also some financial regulation to regulate uh, capital flows. But uh, uh, as well, there's also a domestic challenge as well, where you have to build a domestic political coalition to, pe uh, to put people first. No, and the backdrop now is not uh, an existing large income gap between the West and the rest, but the income gap is closing. So it's, so it's not as easy as back in the uh, 1940s or 50s for that matter. Uh, this graph just shows uh, how this uh, great convergence uh, has been taking place, as you can see, uh, especially for East Asia. If you look at uh, per capita income adjusted for inflation, um, you see East Asia has been taking off uh, very rapidly, especially since 1990. Uh, and the gap between the West and the rest has been narrowing. And the next graph shows the famous uh, elephant curve where you know, uh, uh, most of the uh, benefit from uh, the globalization is captured by two uh, groups, uh, you know, rising uh, emerging countries and top 1% of uh, the, 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 the global elite, basically, and bottom 90% uh, in the United States and Western Europe are being squeezed. So this is the famous uh, elephant curve. So what was the nature of COVID shock given this pre-existing uh, pre condition? Uh, I think if you look at the magnitude of the COVID shock itself, uh, you, have to, you would have to acknowledge that it has been relatively small in magnitude, at least so far. Uh, COVID deaths around the world as of end September uh, reached about 1 million people, and that's about 0.113% of the uh, global population. Uh, 
Uh, by contrast, uh, 1918 uh, flu epidemic led to uh, uh, deaths around the world amounting to about 1%. And uh, the Black Pest, uh, the plague, uh, resulted in uh, huge uh, deaths, a large number of deaths in Europe at the time, about you know, 30 to 50 percent, according to a historian's uh, uh, calculation. Uh, but uh, despite this relatively small uh, impact in terms of quantitative uh, results, uh, I think COVID shock had a large cognitive impact as a uh, you know, uh, previous speakers uh, mentioned, uh, there has been an ampli amplification, if you will, of uh, mutual distrust, especially between uh, the United States and China. And also, importantly, there has been a reassessment uh, of advanced industrial countries, you know, uh, given what was going on in Italy, Spain, France, and then the United States, uh, what I call emperor has no close moment. Uh, was uh, was reached in many developing and emerging countries, and this has some implication. I I think uh, uh, going forward, and finally, although this hasn't materialized as much, I think there's uh, some recognition of the need for global cooperation, given the nature of uh, epidemics, uh, the, the global uh, value chains, and so on. And on the right hand side, what I show you is a, is a figure uh, uh, presented by Michael Osterholm, an uh, epidemiologist at the University of Minnesota. He basically uh, compares and contrasts the days to uh, circumnavigate the globe with the red line and uh, this, uh, the size of global population with the blue line. Basically, the world is becoming a more and more populous place uh, and it's uh, becoming easier to you know, travel around the world. So things like diseases, uh, uh, you know, uh, emissions and, uh, and goods and services travel around the world very quickly. And I mean, at the end of the day, you have to see the need for global cooperation. But given uh, the mutual uh, distrust and strategic competition, this is not easy. So I uh, like to leave you with some food for thought for the uh, challenges for global cooperation. If we go back to the uh, creation of embedded uh, liberalism, the, the uh, liberal international order after World War II, there was uh, support for rules-based order versus uh, uh, power-based order. And I think the key insight was you have to support the principle of equality before law, you know, rules-based order, rules and norms. But at the same time, you have to compromise on exceptions for some veto power to make multilateral re uh, regime palatable to great powers who may uh, uh, prefer hub and spoke kind of uh, negotiations uh, uh, otherwise. And you also have to write rules that address uh, the problem of prisoner's dilemma and the tragedy of the commons. Uh, you know, common but differentiated responsibility is a principle that is supposed to uh, 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 guide our collective action in climate change. And something like that has to be strengthened. And uh, given the, the situation we are in, I, I think it's uh, necessary to look at the possibility of expandable uh, cooperation or variable geometry. You know, think about an interse intersection of interests and compatibility of systems and form a coalition and build a system of rules that can be accepted by everyone, you know, uh, gradually or in stages, more through the force of logic than the uh, logic of force. And finally, even though there has been a lot of talk about decoupling and reconfiguration of uh, global value chains, uh, I think at the end of the day, we are back to something like uh, China plus a few strategy. First, uh, given you know, uh, what we have experienced uh, due to COVID crisis, it's wise to build a, a strategic stockpile and secure a domestic manufacturing base for essential supplies. And also diversify and multi-source to deal with uh, idiosyncratic risks. However, if you are going to invest in other countries, you need to focus on nation, uh, national capability to deal with crises uh, such as uh, COVID in addition to the usual economic considerations. Uh, 
And if you uh, are a multinational corporation, if you uh, think about national capability to deal with crises, as well as the usual economic fundamentals, you are back to countries like China and Vietnam, uh, both ruled by Communist Party, by the way, uh, that have great uh, economic fundamentals, uh, but also domestic capability to deal with crisis. And uh, you know, uh, this is uh, something like a parting thought, but basically uh, it's important to diversify risks, uh, risks, but at the end of the day, uh, it's basically China plus a few in my view. That's what I think, thank you. Thanks, Wen Hyuk. Um, they're just, there's a wealth of things that you've raised there. I just want to um, highlight one, and I think we'll try to come back to it in the, in the last panel, which is this combination of global convergence, which is the increase in the incomes of developing countries, and of course, most obviously China, at the same time that you have this increase in inequality in the advanced industrial states, and the rise of populism and even backsliding from democracy and how those two storylines fit together. I mean, does populism end up challenging China or does populism end up aligning with China? And, right. and of course it depends on the nature of the population in the country in question. But you know, I wanna come back to that theme because it's a, it's a rich presentation. Uh, we're running a little bit behind. And so let me introduce this next set of papers uh, because I think that <clears throat> one of the features of this being great power competition is it's kind of globalized. And for those of you who watch this probably more closely than me, one of the things I found most striking is how quickly Europe is changing its view of the China problem. Uh, this is a development which has been brewing, you can argue, but just simply in the last less than a year, you've seen quite significant movement and a new thinking on China. Uh, and of course, Eurasia is going to be another piece of this, as is the multilateral setting. That's been a longstanding theme in our conversation here. So let me just uh, reintroduce very briefly, Matthias Matisse is, a, is at SAIS. I've corresponded with him extensively. I haven't had the pleasure to meet you. Um, Jacopo Pepe, I had his name wrong. It isn't Pepe Jacopo, it's Jacopo Pepe will be talking to us about Eurasia. And then Alan Alexandrov will talk about multilateralism. The format will be the same. I do see a number of good questions in the chat. I am going to try to work those in. But um, Matthias, why don't you get us started and talk about uh, the European story? You're muted, Matthias. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you, uh, Professor Haggard. I am uh, sharing my screen. So, um, Professor Lim has asked me to talk about the, the role of Europe in this, in this broader debate. And so I'm going to focus on the EU and the world after COVID-19. And I think as any of you who follow Europe closely will know, the last 10 years have been very much focused on internal, its internal problems, right? And so, we now see how internal dynamics will, will shape its, its external relations. What I think is striking is that the initial response of Europe to COVID-19, the collective response to the pandemic was, was problematic, right? So if you think of Europe in the spring of 2020, which now feels like 10 years ago, uh, it was still very much recovering from multiple crises, from Eurozone, debt crisis, migration, Brexit, the rule of law crisis in Hungary and Poland, Russian aggression, and of course, since Donald Trump's election, a much more hostile America, the United States that traditionally has been very supportive of, of European integration. And these crises have shown various fault lines, right? Whether they're north-south over economics or east-west over immigration and, and the rule of law. Also, COVID hit when the EU had new leadership. Right, Christine Lagarde at uh, the European Central Bank, a brilliant finance minister and IMF managing director, but not a monetary uh, policy expert per se. Um, as well, Ursula von der Leyen as um, um, commission president and, and, and Charles Michel. And 
add to that that the EU actually has very little competence in public health, right? It, it, it's not, it's deliberately been kept at the nation state level. And that's also true for fiscal affairs. Everybody wanted immediate guarantees of wages and, and, and wage support and unemployment benefits and, and so on. And so again, these are two things that national governments uh, are responsible for. And then in, a, in an almost cruel twist of fate, this pandemic hit Southern Europe the worst, right? And it hit Italy the first, and that's from many points of view, the most problematic member state uh, economically. And then of course it, it, it spread to France and Spain and everywhere else. And so the initial response was, was bad, right? There were national border closures, there were export bans nationally, where German export bans of medical equipment, French export bans. And so very quickly, uh, this was then translated to EU export bans, but that hit the periphery of Europe, places like Serbia, like Albania and so on. And so famously, the Serbian uh, president said this EU solidarity is a myth. We're looking towards our brothers in, in, in China and Xi Jinping is our, is our brother and you know, the European leaders uh, aren't. And so that, that was at least the, the initial uh, theme. I mean, the initial um, um, impression from, from Europe was that humanitarian aid was coming from China and Russia. There were airplanes landing in Rome and Barcelona and, and not from the United States and not uh, from, from Europe itself. And so a series of beginner's mistakes uh, were, were made, I think, in, in the spring, uh, which very much reopened this kind of north-south divide um, uh, initially, right? And so I, I think, you know, this, this was all March. We were all in a state of confusion, trying to figure out how to teach online uh, via Zoom and so on. I mean, the, the whole world was kind of quickly trying to adapt. But, but I think it's fair to say, surprisingly, for someone like myself who's been studying European integration for almost 20 years, is that actually Europe got its act together very, very quickly, right? The monetary policy response was, was impressive after Christine Lagarde's initial gaffe where she said, we're not here to, uh, you know, close the spreads between Italy and Germany, to which financial markets panicked and she had to apologize for the next day. But the pandemic emergency purchasing program is a kind of phenomenal program that kind of solved much of the initial liquidity problems of, of European governments. And then I think the most important thing, and that's important for the broader uh, discussion today, is this kind of Corona U-turn by Germany, right? Where there's this Franco-German proposal that's put on the table in, in May 20 of this year, where they commit to Corona uh, recovery grants worth 500 billion euro. But of course, the key point for anybody who knows Europe is that the proposal from Germany was that this would be jointly financed by jointly issued or at least EU issued bonds. I think what's gotten less attention in that Franco-German proposal is the point about EU sovereignty. And that's a very French idea, right? And that this was proposed in health and green and digital and also in industrial uh, resilience, right? So this was then quickly taken over by the European Commission in their proposal for the next generation uh, EU that did put together 750 billion euros uh, worth of a recovery plan spread out over the next three, four years. We did see the north-south gap, but what's striking, of course, the Frugal Five, Netherlands, Austria, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland, who didn't like the idea of grants, who didn't particularly care for the jointly issued EU Commission bonds, is that Germany sided with the rest. And so there was a compromise that was, that was possible. And, and in the end, you know, remarkably quick. I mean, the implementation now is what's in the news and the European Parliament needs to approve it. But that was, so that was in the end, I think, surprising for many Eurosceptics. And, and secondly, the national public health response was, was remarkably effective, right? I mean, all of us in the United States in mid-July were kind of marveling at the European figures um, uh, while the US was rising. So rising cases at some point, 50, 60,000 new infections a day. Um, and so compared to the US, this was very impressive. Of course, we now see that this was somewhat a pyrrhic victory because as schools reopen in Europe, we very much see a second corona wave of infections now. Now, two things, uh, and, th and then I'll, I'll, I'll give it back to, to Professor Haggard. The impact of Brexit, I think, has been, has been kind of important here, right? The UK formally left the European Union on January 31, 2020, so you know, a, a few weeks before uh, the pandemic hit. And uh, there's been a positive impact of this, right? The UK actually leaving the EU uh, 
uh, it was clearly not the beginning of the end for the European Union because the, the, the union that's really in trouble and that's the subject for another uh, day is, is the future of the United Kingdom. It's hard to imagine next generation EU coming together with the UK as a full member. And so there's a kind of an important veto player gone now, which will make integration compromises easier in the future. Of course, there's a great negative impact of the UK leaving the EU, right? There's a, here we're talking about a nuclear power, a permanent five member of the UN with global reach, with London, a, a global financial center and a very large economy. And so with the, without the UK as a member, the EU strategic ambitions sound a lot more um, hollow. And so there's a kind of loss of tremendous soft power as well that comes with, with, with the English language and, and, and culture and, and, and so on, the UK no longer being a member. And remember the traditionally close diplomatic relationship with the United States. So it's, it's definitely a mixed blessing from a strategic point of view. Now, the big concept, and that's kind of the, the key point of this, of this presentation that the EU is committed to is this idea of open strategic autonomy. Now, what does that mean? Because obviously it means that Europe wants to be self-reliant and self-sufficient on certain important strategic uh, industries and so on. It's a fuzzy concept, but it could be a useful uh, paradigm. I'll come back to this in the conclusion, right? So what, what does this new Europe mean, this more confident Europe for transatlantic relations, relations with the United States? Well, we're all watching the debate tonight. Uh, so we'll, we'll, the impact of the, the US elections is, is, is gonna be important. And, but no matter who wins, I think, um, uh, although I, I think for the future of NATO, it's important if, if Trump wins, I think all bets are off. Um, but when it comes to trade and WTO reform, I mean, here you can see the US and Europe cooperate more and also in dealing with a, with a rising uh, China, even though I think relations with the US are gonna be more difficult when it comes to dealing with um, Russia. Part of me thinks that EU-Russia relations could improve again, even though, of course, Putin doesn't make it easy by constantly poisoning people all over the place. Um, but Germany will be the key player after Brexit, right? It's already the key player in dealing with Russia now. They're, they're still going ahead with Nord Stream 2. It's important for them. It's important geopolitically. And so will there be another reset in, in relations or will they continue the, the idea of wandel to handle change through trade uh, remains, remains to be seen. But where I do see a, a significant worsening uh, in relations is the EU-China relationship, right? I mean, Merkel's big crowning achievement was supposed to be a few days ago, a Leipzig summit of heads of state between the EU, all EU leaders in China that was basically shelved. There was, it was clear this year that there was very little agreement on an EU-China investment treaty, for example, there's gonna be much more scrutiny of inward FDI of China going forward. The way they're, they're seeing Huawei as a clear threat to security and even human rights is becoming a more important point on the agenda when it comes to dealing with the, uh, the issues with Hong Kong or, or, or the Uyghurs uh, in, in Xinjiang and, and, and so on. So we see the EU kind of finally emerging uh, at least in theory, as a strategic actor or, or geopolitical power in a post-COVID world. Well, you know, I, 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 I like to be optimistic about this, but I also know there's unanimity in foreign policy. And as long as there's Orbans and Greece and, and Cyprus and, and there's different players, it's going to be hard to, to come up with this. That being said, this idea of open strategic autonomy could well be the, the new organizing principle of European integration going forward, right? In the 50s, uh, Professor Lim's already mentioned embedded liberalism. That was the organizing principle from the 80s onwards. It's been neoliberalism, but it, it's clear that that paradigm of single market and single currency has run, run its course. So EU sovereignty, where there's a clear division of labor between EU and member states, may, could well be uh, the, the future. So, but but you, you have the EU stuck in between this kind of new Cold War between the US and, and, and China. And so they, I think they will continue to fight for multilateralism and democratic principles. And this may have more of an inherent appeal to other countries like Japan, Korea, Australia, Mexico, than, than the US or, or, or Chinese uh, model. But I've probably already used too much of my time, so let me give it back to Professor Haggard. Thank you. Matthias, that's terrific. I, I was going to raise some questions and get a discussion going, but we are running a little behind. One thing I do want to come back to you on, though, is whether you see some of these incredible initiatives we've seen in the EU over the last year, whether you see those as enduring. That is, you know, are they just a result of COVID and then, you know, will they persist? So if you can give some thought to that, because I think that's going to play into what role Europe plays 
uh, on the larger world stage. Uh, Alex, uh, do you want to take, a, uh, excuse me, uh, Jacopo, do you want to take us uh, to Eurasia and let's, let's have a discussion of how that fits into the broader picture? Jacopo? Yeah, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Professor Hegard. And thank you to the Reshava Center and the KDI School for having me today and for uh, let me share with you some of my thoughts on uh, um, a very somehow similar topic, uh, which is a follow-up to, 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 to what Matthias has been talking uh, in the past minutes, uh, which is basically how the triangular u china russia relation might evolve in a post-COVID world uh, and in fact uh, impact uh, the um, power relations across Eurasia. Um, I mean, let me start with the first uh, bold remark. Eurasia is politically and economically much more than the relation between the EU, Russia, and China. Um, we have heard about the great uh, convergence. This means basically that in the spaces in between Russia, China, and the EU, middle and small powers are re-emerging. They stretch from Turkey to Iran to the broader Caspian Basin uh, uh, up to Southeast Asia, but uh, Korea in Japan and Northeast Asia, we have heard. Um, they play, the, the, the role they might uh, play or uh, play again um, also in, broader region, uh, in the broader Eurasian context. However, I still think that the EU-China-Russia triangle remains quintessential in shaping uh, power relations across Eurasia and interconnection attempts. And so looking at Eurasia through this lens, through the lens of the EU-Russia-China triangle, my question would be, is the relation changing uh, through and uh, thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic? And if so, is this leading to a less Sino-centric Eurasia or on the contrary, on a more um, Sino-centric Eurasian order? Mm. In order for us to, I think, understand the impact of COVID on Eurasia and on trilateral EU-Russia relation, uh, EU-China-Russia relation, I think we should look briefly before COVID and uh, I think that the first thing to, 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 to say is that COVID is not a trendsetter or a turning point. I mean, this is an accelerator of trends, and we have heard it already, which were already unfolding uh, well and long before uh, uh, the, the pandemic. And uh, I would say at least since the economic and financial crisis 2008-2010. They go from a contestation of the global liberal economic and political order by both China and Russia to a regional concentration and continentalization of value and supply chains driven by technological transformation like digitalization, containerization first and then green economy, geopolitization of trade and transport politics with the BRI, uh, but also uh, with the Trans-Pacific um, Free Trade Agreement as it was originally conceived. Uh, and the final shift uh, um, in, toward the more interconnected Sinocentric Eurasian, Asian Pacific system without having, however, common security architecture and economic governance. Now, against this backdrop, I think that the, the EU-Russia-China relation has been at the core of a contradictory development across Eurasia. We have, um, we have been experiencing accelerated economic and infrastructure interconnection which has been driven by China, even though not necessarily only by the Belt and Road Initiative, it predates it. And at the same time, a geopolitical multipolarization and fragmentation uh, of the Eurasian, of the Eurasian uh, landmass with new uh, players emerging also as response to China. Now, uh, against this, 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 this backdrop of this contradictory somehow development, I think that China has, though, emerged as the cornerstone of this trilateral EU-Russia-China uh, relation, thanks to four elements. The first has been the booming EU-China trade and economic relations since the early 2000, 2000, which has been basically driven by the German-China integration in value and supply chain across the continent. This has led to a more diplomatic, political, cooperative relation, but also to an increase in the asymmetric interdependence in favor of China, which has been um, appearing more clearly in the years shortly before the COVID pandem pandemic. The second thing is, which is less discussed, is how China parallel to it has steepened bi-directional trade and energy ties, uh, 
with other Eurasian and Middle, Asia, Middle Eastern producers beyond the West and beyond Europe. Third, we have been a growing estrangement in the EU-Russia political and economic relation, which has picked up in 2014 with the Ukraine crisis and that's ending up in a relative decline in bilateral economic ties and worsening uh, relations. And fourth, on this basis, the emergence of a stronger though asymmetric Russia-China strategic partnership, which is basically trying to um, uh, <clears throat> realize itself in uh, integration schemes across Eurasia, the Belt and Road and the Eurasian Economic Union. Now, this is what happened. This was the, the, the great scheme of things before COVID. Now, has COVID changed this equation? My take is that the equation has been changed in the sense that COVID will introduce a new dynamic in this relation, even though the trends will stay the same. The EU and US are still struggling to recover. We have heard it while China will apparently recover very soon, and is already actually recovering. The Russia-China relation has strengthened and deepened, and even the asymmetric dependence uh, uh, of Russia uh, from China has, has, has increased. While the BRI is still the powerful instrument uh, of China to promote and channel new industrial technology and most important own standards. On the other side, uh, I would be less optimistic about China or pessimistic, depending on how do you see it, about the, the ability of China to, to, to build up on this. I see three limiting factors. The first one is the loss of credibility in terms of China, in terms of supplier of intermediate industrial goods, but also as a political diplomatic partner, not only in Europe, but in large part of Eurasia, including Russia. Second point is that the Chinese companies amid uh, the US-China rivalry and the COVID pandemic seem to need to refocus first on the domestic market, second on the immediate neighborhood. And we have heard this as well in the Asia Pacific. While at the same time, foreign companies, including from Japan and Korea, but also German companies are relocating in order to diversify their supply chains. This, this includes Southeast Asia, East, Central Eastern Europe and continental Eurasia. This leaves Beijing, I think, both exposed to greater competition on the Asian markets and at the same time, less central in Asia's regional production networks. But the third and most important thing that is on the political side, we have already heard from Matthias, I couldn't agree more. Um, we have experiencing both a dramatic change in the EU position uh, on China, uh, which is now called basically a strategic competitor, competitor. And in order to cope with the Chinese challenge, uh, the EU has been effectively seeking for greater strategic autonomy, resilience and diversification of supply chains. But less discussed is the slightly enlightened Russia um, shift. Um, the dependence on China has been augmented by the COVID pandemic and, China, and Russia has been clearly perceiving that he cannot really they cannot really manage the junior partner role in it and that they are losing uh, foreign policy autonomy, which is basically a cornerstone of Russia uh, foreign policy thinking. Now, the Russia's relation with China may become indeed less exclusive and more fluid and less stable as we used to think. And I just heading and rushing to the conclusion, the logic of Eurasian transformation toward the more interconnected supercontinent, I don't think has been fundamentally changed by COVID. However, COVID has accelerated the need to diversify away from China and for greater interactions between Europe, continental Eurasia and South Southeast Asia, bypassing and around China. Geopolitical competition and economic regionalization might increase the struggle for controlling and securing the new value chains, green and digital are among them. Um, which brings me to uh, the, the second and third um, the development. The EU-China relation will move from a wary cooperation to fierce competition both in Europe and across Eurasia. Russia-China relation will remain stable but become more fluid. And for the EU-Russia relation, and I agree with Mattis, it's for now will going to remain strained and conflictual. However, I do think that it will move toward a more pragmatic and transactional relation, particularly considering both the need to nearshoring production and include Western Russia and the industrial districts of Western Russia into the broader uh, Central European manufacturing networks and the um, emergence of new technology in the energy sector, particularly hydrogen, for which Russia is deeply needed.
So as a consequence, I do think that China will remain central in the Eurasian integration, but the dream of a Sinocentric continent in a Sinocentric post-COVID world may have been too early dreamed of. Thanks. Glad to hear your question. Well, I, I have to say uh, that these two presentations, Matthias and Jacopo, for those of us who work primarily on the Asia Pacific are just eye-opening. I mean, there's just clearly a lot going on there that we'll pick up in questions. But given again that we're running uh, short, uh, Alan, can I ask you to round this out by turning to the multilateral setting? And if you can keep it to uh, seven or eight minutes, that would be really great because we want to try Uh, thanks, Steph. I knew you were going to urge uh, uh, some shortness here so that we can at least get to some questions, right? So uh, let me uh, very, very quickly kind of summarize what I was looking at. And this was a You're focus. You're also a little unstable, Alan. Um, yeah. Alan, I'm wondering... It might be worthwhile to turn off. We've got a instability. You're having difficulty hearing me? Uh, we can off can go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Are you okay? You might want to turn off your video, Alan. I mean, to see if sure. that would save some bandwidth. Okay. Yeah. There we are. Maybe that'll give us a little bit more bandwidth here. How's that? Yeah, yeah that's good. Okay, so let me, let me be uh, quick uh, since we, and give ourselves some time to, for collective ac action here. Um, I, was foc I focused uh, the research for Lim Wan Hook on uh, the question of multilateralism both in its economic dimensions and its uh, political dimension. And I was intrigued uh, to understand uh, the meaning and influence of uh, multilateralism, particularly in the face of, you know, growing tensions between the US and China, uh, the calls for decoupling and reshoring, uh, President Trump's attacks on multilateralism, and, uh, you know, an area that I do focus on, uh, leaders summits, uh, the difficulties that leaders summits have uh, in um, collaborating even during this challenging period of, uh, of the COVID pandemic. And um, multilateralism, it seems to me, is conditioned by a number of features and they change over time and therefore multilateralism has changed over time. Uh, it's conditioned by the structure, meaning the shape of the global order, the state of the actors, how many, who they are, and the arrangements and their behaviors. And this comes about, this uh, activity, my research, in part because I'm working with a number of my colleagues in what we call uh, the Vision 20, where the principals are Colin Bradford, who is a non-resident fellow at Brookings, Eve Tiberjan, professor of political science at UBC, and myself. And we raised this question of what we call effective multilateralism. And we meant by that, we mean by that today, uh, it resides in those clubs, fora, coalitions, and arrangements that are prepared to move forward on policy to act on a collective action basis, uh, whether uh, they include all of the actors or not. Formal or informal institutions are not the limiting concern, right? Effective multilateralism, we believe, can operate at the state level, but there clearly are a much greater variety of actors today than just states, right? And so we think that those actors may have a significant impact on multilateralism. Right? Uh, uh, critically, we look at the possibility that such multilateralism could operate without the inclusion of the so-called leading powers. Um, the quick definition, of course, of multilateralism was the practice of coordinating uh, 
national policy in groups of three or more states. That came from Robert Cohen in 1990, right? And it was then advanced in part by our good colleague, John Ruggie, who said, yeah, well, yes, the number uh, which coordinates the relations among three or more states on the basis though of generalized principles. And that was the key. So that you could have a view of multilateralism, which was not just defined by um, great powers or hegemonic powers, right? And indeed that impact has been felt by others. Uh, most recently, for instance, John Eikenberry, who just completed his book, his latest book on liberal internationalism, which was released just this uh, month. And he said, it's called A World Safe for Democracy. And John said, this is what John Ruggie calls multilateralism, an architectural form of international organization that coordinates relations among a group of states on the basis of the generalized prin principles of conduct. The rules and principles they embody have some impartiality and independent standing. They are not merely the exhortations of powerful state, but norms of conduct to which groups of state adhere, regardless of their specific power or circumstance. And therefore, the point was to try and examine, are there instances in which this effective multilateralism uh, in, implicitly or explicitly has taken place uh, in, uh, in, the in the international order? And it does seem to me uh, that we had, and I won't go into it now, but there, we had to then look at, you know, kind of an examination. Does multilateralism have to include the powerful states, or can we see instances where uh, there are actions by collective groups of states, which are not necessarily the leading powers? We also looked at the, uh, the definition of middle powers because frequently multilateralism is described as actions by middle powers. But the question becomes, who are the middle powers? Uh, you know, there are the traditional middle powers, Canada, Australia, and so forth, but there are many other powers today in the world. Um, large emerging market powers like India, Brazil. Uh, there are the actions in Europe and the collective action of the EU as well. And so uh, it seems to us that there are in fact instances, let me just mention a couple, where we've seen the activity of uh, uh, collective arrangements of powers, but are not necessarily the leading powers. And this is what we were looking for, we're hunting for, right? So for instance, we looked at um, German leadership at the Hamburg Sand Summit, this is the G20 summit in 2017, where in fact, uh, uh, Angela, Chancellor Angela Merkel broke the consensus that had been evident since the time of the creation of the leaders' summits in 2008 uh, by including in the leaders' declaration a statement of support for the Paris Climate Change Agreement, though the United States opposed uh, that statement. And so the collective group of 19 uh, pressed forward on that, uh, on that uh, uh, expression of support, notwithstanding that the United States' position uh, uh, was expressed as opposing it. Japan has proven, and now this is under the Abe leadership, we'll see whether or not Japan continues to do so. But of course, Japan picked up the um, uh, effort uh, to conclude the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and many have mentioned it, um, in what's called the CPTPP. Surprising, but nevertheless, there is a leadership at, at issue without, obviously, the United States. Um, and that is a, another expression. And finally, we've looked at the effort by uh, uh, the French uh, Foreign Minister, Jean-Yves Le Drain, and uh, the German foreign minister, Heiko Maas, they created in 2019 something called the Alliance for Multilateralism. Uh, the initial meeting held on April 2nd, 2019. Uh, and uh, it, it was a focus by uh, the, the, uh, the, the co-host, plus some 48 other countries to support renewal of the rule of law 
And that is, it seems to us, is a, a, another possible avenue. We'll have to see where the commitment it was interesting in the last few days have been talking to uh, those who ha are uh, advising officials in Canada. And I'm suggesting here's a perfect institutional instrument in which you can uh, focus on the rule of law issues and, and Canada, as one knows, has had grave difficulties around uh, que certain questions with China and certain other questions with the United States with respect to uh, issues uh, of politics uh, in the internet, in the, in, in the global governance system. So let me stop there so at least it gives some amount of time staff to uh, collective discussion. Yeah, this is terrific. I think I'm going to draw on all four of us um, <clears throat> that are, have been part of this session, uh, Alan, and Jacopo, and, uh, and Matthias. And let me, let me try to weave in more of the questions that we're getting um, <clears throat> from the audience so it's not just us talking. Minye at BU asks a question that I'm particularly interested in as well about how uh, U.S.-China competition is played out through competing visions of regionalism. I mean, Jacopo, this came up in your uh, talk particularly. I was really struck by this conception of a, um, a, a, a an EU-Russia-China competition um, for regional influence. Can you just say a few words about how regional institutions may play a role in that competition on the Eurasian um, on the Eurasian landmass. Well, very briefly, from a European perspective, uh, uh, the EU has been uh, an ever-expanding institutional project, with the Eastern Neighborhood Policy, uh, with uh, the, the the attempt to the expand uh, uh, the border of the acquis communautaire beyond. Uh, even the, 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 the formal board of the European Union, even when the, the, the Eastern enlargement was, was completed, uh, is uh, the most famous, exam famous and, and, and known example. But we should uh, look uh, with more attention at the Eurasian Economic Union, and uh, which even though it's also a geopolitical project led by Russia, it's uh, nevertheless um, attempting to create gas, energy, oil, and transportation market with unified standards and norms. This is a very long-term project, but uh, there are first uh, signs uh, um, uh, in this direction. Uh, and uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and China, this is a less uh, space-based project than a more, a more fluid and network-based approach which is more fluid in space, but it's basically based on connecting regional production clusters and networks all across uh, the Eurasian continent, and particularly between the Central Western Chinese regions and Central Eastern Europe. Um, including, however, the, the, the Southern uh, Eurasian countries uh, en route, which includes first and most Turkey and in the long, ter in the long term tar uh, Iran. So, um, Regionalism or a world of regions, I think, is what made uh, um, emerge out of uh, the Eurasian uh, uh, landmass. Yeah, well, Matthias, let me, let me bring you in on this. I, mean, I, I guess I have two questions following up on Jacopo's interesting intervention. One is, is, I guess, what's driving this? I mean, is this simply the outcome of efforts to make money, to put it bluntly? where Europe sees advantages in kind of extending and deepening international production networks? Or is this a more self-conscious process? I mean, does the EU see the Eurasian space as a place where it feels it needs to compete? Is, is that the conception in Brussels or in the European capitals? Or is this uh, not seen that way? Uh, I mean, you uh, raise... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, sorry, sorry. Let's start with Matthias and then Jacopo. I, I definitely want to bring sorry, you in sorry. on this question as well. Yeah. No, you, you raise an excellent point, um, Steph. I mean, the problem with the European Union is that they haven't, I mean, I, I wouldn't say there's been systematic thinking about this, right? I mean, this is mostly driven by larger countries, right? By uh, Germany thinks about this, France thinks about it. Of course, the UK does, but now the UK is no longer part of the EU. Um, and also just the nature of the European crises over the last of integration of the last 10 years has meant that Europe has been very focused uh, 
inwardly. That being said, I think the election of Donald Trump was definitely a kind of wake up moment for many in Europe, especially in Germany, where it's like, well, we can no longer rely on, on the US to kind of, you know, chart our course. And what they realized that, you know, like they, they have actual approaches, interests, and, you know, whether this is business driven or politically driven on the Eurasian continent. And they also feel that they can play a, a more strategic role there um, because of the security implications because of it being right next to its door. Right. Jacopo, do you, do you want to jump back in on this? I mean, this is... Yeah, very briefly, we take the German example because not only because Germany is the, the leading and the driving force are, um, beside, be, behind this, this process, but because this is uh, what they've been uh, uh, working on since my time at the Reshawa Center, how Germany interacts with the broader region space. Uh, in the case of Germany, I would say until be, shortly before the COVID-19, this was explicitly business driven. Germany, it has, has been de facto part of the Eurasian broader integration process. The German Chinese value chains elongated along uh, continental Eurasia, which predates the Belt and Road Initiative were business driven. What is now changing is that Germany as part of, uh, of the European Union as a driving force is now understanding that it's not only business as usual, but that you need to compete for market spaces and that market is power. And so the discussion in Germany is how to face uh, state capitalism like the Chinese one without having the um, state backed institutions and business models that the Chinese have. So now it's also in Germany is going on a sort of rethinking of their own uh, strategic uh, approach to foreign economic policy. Yeah, and this, this actually allows me to segue to, to Alan. Alan, you raised a very interesting point, which I, which I think the Western led, if we can call it that, uh, multilateral institutions might have an advantage, which is their willingness to incorporate civil society groups. And of course, John Ruggie was not just a theorist of this, he was also a practitioner in working on the global compact and, and so on. But let me pull back to the standard uh, multilateral institutions. We clearly have a crisis going on with the WTO. Uh, can it be salvaged, to put it most bluntly? And what role will it play in blunting some of these things that Jacopo and Matthias are talking about, which is how you manage a China, which appears to be pursuing just a fundamentally different economic model, in my view, than anything that, that, um, that Europe, the United States, and Japan, uh, you know, can really tolerate. Yeah, well, it, it, you know, you, you have to do, it seems to me, differentiate it. Uh, there, there has been a failure for some time, and everybody points it out. Uh, uh, to tackle the unwillingness of, of the Chinese uh, to live up to their commitments at the pro uh, to the protocol of accession. And so then the question becomes, okay, so how do you deal with that? But there's a second uh, issue here, which is the failure of the uh, WTO itself to keep up with the, the leading global economic issues, right? data, uh, e-commerce, and all the rest of it. So there are really, you know, kind of two problems. I'm not sure, obviously, if the uh, Trump administration returns, um, I think it unlikely you'll get that reform of the, uh, of the WTO. And the best that we can examine then is this interim agreement under Article 25 of the WTO, which has a whole number of countries uh, in effect, substituting uh, a, a, a dispute resolution mechanism for the WTO permanent, the DSM, right, and the DSP. So um, it, it, if, if the Biden administration comes into office, there might be some ability to uh, uh, do, tackle both, both problems, which is uh, the WTO reform problem, which is real, and needs a significant uh, change. And the China problem, which has been true since um, the, the time of the protocol, and if you listen to people like Charlene Barshevsky and others, the failure of the collective leadership to take on uh, 
China with respect to, to some of the commitments it made under the protocol, uh, which is now uh, well overdue. No, no, these are, these are, these are really good points. Uh, Matthias, I wanna, I wanna come back to you on the European side. Just We'll do one more round, I think. We've been online for almost two hours, which is a long time to have talking heads coming at you. But <laughs> I was just really struck by your um, description, brief but pointed, of, of these quite significant, to me as an outsider, quite significant developments within the EU over the course of the COVID period, um, and particular apparent German acquiescence to allowing things to be pooled in a way we haven't seen before. Um, can, you, can you talk more about whether you see this as an enduring development in the EU, or is this something that's pot potentially vulnerable to the end of COVID, which is one of our questioners asks, is, is it ever coming? <laughs> Maybe, maybe gonna... there is no such thing as a post-COVID world. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, your, your en enduring question is, is the most important question, right, in, in all of this. But to come back to Jacopo's earlier point, I mean, the, the Germans made a strategic choice a few years ago that their view of competition, the way the EU was structured in the 80s and the 90s, based on kind of the single market, very tight, very tough competition rules, right? No state aids, no intervention, something Margaret Thatcher insisted on in the 80s because she was worried the Germans and the French were going to do too much of it. And of course, right now, uh, which is the, the sticking point in the Brexit negotiations, right? So Germany saw very clearly that you, you needed to have an industrial policy. You couldn't do it as a country on its own. So they, they kind of made this pact with the French that they were going to do this at the EU level, right? Now, whether there's all kinds of opposition still from smaller countries, especially in the North, the Netherlands, and so on. But this seems to me the new organizing principle, right? That in a, in a new world of much more strategic competition, whether it's for markets or for, you know, important, um, you know, new innovative technologies and so on, you just, you have to do this the Chinese or the American way, right? And so I guess the European way is to cooperate um, on, on this. The second point, and I think that will, so that I think will prove enduring. What will prove less enduring as we have to see still is this next generation EU fund, right? The 750 billion euros that they've committed. They're gonna pay off the, this debt over 30 years. So from that point of view, it's enduring, right? I mean, this is well <laughs> beyond the current commission. But the, the one fuzzy thing is, at some point, they're going to need their own resources. And that's where I'm a lot more, I guess, I've lived in the United States for 20 years. So I, I share that skepticism that when it comes down to a digit tax or a carbon tax or a plastic tax, whatever they've launched, this is not the kind of thing that national member state governments easily want to give up or see to right. the EU level, right? And so I, I see a real fight there. And so it's perfectly possible. Inshallah, post-COVID world, the economies recover, say 2025, that Northern European small countries are saying, listen, do we really need the EU to have more of its own resources? Let's just bring this back to, to national governments. So, so I, I completely agree that, that it's too early to tell. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, most people don't read um, campaign platforms, but if you look at Biden's uh, campaign platform, there's a lot of industrial policy there. Buy American, funding of R&D, trying to use the tax system to get firms onshored. Uh, very detailed. Now, whether that will survive whatever the outcome is in the Senate, the Senate in particular, <laughs> we, don't, we don't know. But at least that kind of thinking seems to be resurfacing. And I'm going to turn to Wanyuk at the end to maybe come back to some of those themes, because I know that's something that's near and dear to his heart. Jacopo, let me, let me ask, let me close with one last Asia question, because I think in some ways you and maybe Mike can jump back in on this. How should we be thinking about the China-Russia relationship at this juncture? Um, you know, that's, you, you painted this very interesting picture of really a triangular set of relations on the Eurasian landmass, with Europe being the third player. Uh, I think from a Pacific lens, the concern is focused more on how congruent are Russian and Chinese interests at this juncture? Maybe if you can um, just say a few words on that, and then Mike, I'll bring you back in, and then we'll turn to Juan here to close us up. Very, very uh, briefly. Uh, first point, 
the pivot, Russia's pivot to Asia, which turned to be private, private to China, is a, a strategic and not a tactical decision. The Russians have, in terms of foreign policy, left Europe and the West. The relation to Asia is not functional to the relation to the West, but it, this is the other way around. So the, the second thing is, however, that uh, the decision to go to Asia was a symbol of uh, renewed foreign policy autonomy uh, by the Russians. COVID has shown that the relation with China is a, a dangerous embrace, which they might not control anymore. And so they may not be uh, um, uh, in control of their own foreign political destiny, which means that they will seek much more than in the past being said that they will stay in Asia, how to balance China in Asia with other uh, Asian powers. First of all, Japan. Um, we know that um, former Prime Minister Abe's attempt to solve uh, the territorial disputes uh, with Russia and Japan, Russia policy reapproachment has failed, but I think he has um, had good points and at least paving the way to a renewed Russian-Japanese uh, uh, relation. Um, which means, th this is not to say from a European perspective that the Russians, as I said, will come back to Europe or they will leave the Chinese partnership. This is <laughs> something which the Russians will keep as sort of, um, sort of, uh, <clears throat> guarantee for uh, their role in the world, but they will look pragmatical ad hoc relations with both U single European countries, Germany being the first and most important, as well with East Asian countries. This includes uh, Japan, but also Korea and extends to the Indo-Pacific, to, to India and Southeast Asia. The Eurasian Economic Union is seeking for free trade agreements, which are not, not yet preferential agreements, um, uh, but they, it, they are seeking actively uh, free trade agreements uh, with uh, broader Asia beyond China. Jacobo, a fascinating discussion. Uh, Mike, we started with China, let's end with China. Do you have a, a last thought on, on some of these issues looked at not from the, let me get my directions right, from the East, which is where we're, where we're sitting, uh, but from the West? Uh, do you have my image and hear my yes, voice? you're fine. Yeah, great. Good. Uh, I guess I would have a sort of simple formula I'm fairly confident about, but I think it could be wrong. And that is, I start from the premise that the real competition is an economic competition globally. It's going to be about uh, innovation and the new industries and building the pathways of connectivity. And without retreating to sort of crude characterizations of Russia. I don't see it a player on any of those dimensions. Uh, and therefore, I think China and this, their partnership is really one of convenience. Also, I, I've only been to Russia and the Russian Far East twice, but I was always struck by the, the vastness of the area, the presence of China, a thin membrane protecting Musa of Russia, from Chinese migration and, and cross-border interaction. And I think the Russians just are basically anxious. They've been careful about allowing Chinese investment in Russia. They've been uh, tried to be careful about weapons transfers to China, although when they get desperate for money, they do it. So I've always thought that intrinsically, uh, the United States, you know, under a different world, not right at the moment, uh, you know, could have better relations with both China and Russia than they can have with themselves. So in short, I'm skeptical about the real staying power uh, that the Sino-Russian cooperation, whatever its magnitude is. Well, listen, now for those of you who have stayed through this, I see we still have about 50 of you. I, I hope you've learned as much uh, from it as I have. It's just an incredible panel of talent. Uh, Wan Hyuk, um, dear leader, do you want to come back on and maybe say a, a last few words for us? Uh, sure, yeah. Well, um, yeah, I thought this was a very good, uh, good uh, event, and I, I'd like to invite Kent to uh, uh, come in later to close the, uh, close the webinar. But for uh, industrial policy uh, question that you raised, uh, Steph, I think we are at an important juncture where uh, we'll have to uh, 
carefully define uh, what is allowable under the WTO rules uh, for state aid, subsidy, and so on. I mean, uh, so far, we haven't had clarity on, you know, uh, subsidies and uh, uh, national security considerations, you know, and what, what, is, uh, what seems to be happening in the uh, last few years is uh, countries justifying uh, trade restrictions um, based on national security considerations. And also, as uh, Alan uh, was getting to, uh, you know, countries, uh, a lot of countries have used uh, basically state aid, state-owned enterprises and subsidies in massive quantities to redefine uh, the competitive uh, dynam uh, uh, dynamics of uh, trade. So we will have to consider the uh, public goods nature of things like R&D, uh, weighed against uh, national security considerations, and at the end of the day, who makes those uh, national security uh, decisions, uh, whether you know, anything can be justified on national security grounds, and uh, this uh, remains a very important uh, it remains a very important question going forward, given the uh, intensifying strategic competition between the United States and China, and uh, the precarious uh, future of the liberal order. So, with that, I'd like to invite Kent. Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Wan Hyuk. I think this has been certainly a very rich dis uh, discussion. The one point that I find uh, uh, consistent across our discussion is the importance in the world which is emerging for, of new actors. Uh, what Alan had to say about the role of Canada, the, uh, certainly the role of Korea. Um, uh, Matthias mentioned Japan, obviously the European Union. We're uh, moving into, of course, whether that will be accepted politically, well, that may well depend, will depend, no doubt, on uh, things that will happen in the next couple of months. But I think this has been a very rich discussion. Steph, we uh, deeply appreciate the magnificent job that you have done of moderating this. We appreciate the uh, support, the initiative of the KDI School. Um, we're proud to have the Reischauer Center for East Asian Studies involved. So thank you everyone and thank you for our audience uh, for all that we have been able to do today. So uh, that concludes. Thank you very much, everyone.